Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to have all of, all of you here, and I hope you're all enjoying the Future of Health Summit. Uh, and um, we're going to have an interesting session, session today. I, I was saying to our panelists earlier that uh, one, of the, one of the interesting characteristics of being at a health summit is we all come at this with love and interest and excitement about improving health, and we talk a lot about the frustrations of lack of investment in prevention and wellness and the difficulties with treatment and care and the inadequate uh, investment in, in research and cure. So I said, we're going to make this fun. And, uh, and, and this is going to be a positive session. And let me tell you why, why I think that that's the case. Um, so as you probably know, and I'm not going to go through the demographics, uh, the world is going to look much older in the decades to come. And so will our, our cities. About 80% uh, of people 65 plus live in cities already. Um, and, uh, and we expect more and more will live in cities in, in the future. And the great thing about cities are, are that they are um, uh, places where, where innovation happens. They're, they're, uh, they're effective. They have leadership that's not driven oftentimes by, by the same political inclinations that drives things at the, at the national level, either, either in the United States or in other countries around the world. Um, so they are uh, incubators. They're places where great things can happen and where people uh, are interested in collaboration and uh, cross-pollinization and, and uh, cross-party activity and, and the like. And so uh, they're great, in a sense, platforms for, uh, for new ideas and new, uh, new uh, in innovations. And, it, and the other thing we're going to focus on today is technology, the promise of technology not just to deliver uh, exciting entertainment and um, interesting uh, devices that, that, uh, that engage us, but really um, to, to change lives in ways that enable us to live longer and healthier uh, and more engaged and more, uh, more socially connected lives. So what I want to do is I want to start off with, with uh, uh, Dave Ryan. Let me actually introduce the panel very quickly. So L Lauren, down at the end, I think all of you have bios, uh, is the head of strategy at, at Uber Health. Uh, Dave, Dave has the, has the world's uh, fanciest title. He is uh, the head of uh, Healthy Aging in the Internet of Things group. Or so, is, am I, did I have it right, Dave? It's something like that. It's, it's a pretty exciting title. Well, health, health and Life Science Business. Health, health and Life Science Business <laughs> yeah. at, at, at Intel, one of the, one of the great uh, companies of the world. You make it sound more exciting. Yeah, it's, it's very it's <laughs> exciting. Uh, uh, Liddy, Liddy joins us from the... Uh, Georgetown Agewell, Agewell Hub, and Emily is the head of uh, aging in, in the great city of, of Boston. Now, I will uh, confess that I'm a Dodger fan, and so Emily and I have already had a couple difficulties in preparation for our, for our session uh, today, so we'll, we'll simply say that, uh, that uh, while Fenway is a great park, we're going we're gonna to win this series. Well, uh, and I think we all so. will win. <laughs> right. uh, so let me, let me begin with, with Dave. Um, and the reason I want to begin with Dave is that Dave has this kind of interesting perspective on, on, the, on the big picture, maybe some of which can translate down to the little picture. How should we change the way we think about aging and how... Um, how does it affect the way we should live in our cities? Well, I just got a new perspective on why you don't want to give Emily any questions. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, we, we're, uh, Intel, we're not a health care or health delivery company. What we are is we're the technology uh, vendor inside uh, and supporting all the vendors that make all of the medical and, and, and wellness products that are used by the health and the, and the wellness world. Um, it's a really interesting nexus of topics in terms of the smart city and health and aging is as we, uh, well, I guess, you know, being the technology person on the panel, I, I can pr probably jump to one key point is as we work with all of these companies attempting and providing solutions all around the world, um, there are no actual technology problems. The technology to do uh, literally if uh, everything you want to do exists, it's on the shelf somewhere, uh, somebody's implemented it. Um, the real challenge is the deployment and all of the other elements of the wraparound uh, related to the business model, the political process, uh, the way systems work administratively or clinically, uh, and 
uh, to, and so you know, technology is really a tool or enabler inside that context. Now, I, I want to mention what we've seen is why smart cities and healthy aging. Well, you know, it's I think fairly well understood around the world that that you know, for a city uh, and for a country, the major pl uh, infrastructure platforms for prosperity, you know, energy, transportation, um, healthcare has over the last. Uh, 10 years, and it's definitely over the last five, healthcare gets listed as one of the main societal infrastructures uh, of, of prosperity. And, uh, but what we see is that uh, if, you, if you try to drive change on a national level, unless it's a single, a sitting, single city country like Singapore, uh, it is, it's really a boil the ocean type of challenge to try and drive change or innovation uh, at that scale. But the mayors and, or the, and the heads of a city uh, have a scope and have uh, everywhere in the world a, a, a set of political and sometimes budgetary power, interdisciplinary budgetary power, to really drive change at, uh, at the scale of the city. And so the smart cities, the cities, are uh, really the tributary of, of innovation. Uh, and so you can, and innovation and uh, changes that have gotten, that get proved out in a particular city, usually uh, under the leadership of an inspired mayor uh, and council, uh, then can bubble up to a regional level uh, or to a state level. And so the, we see lots of innovation at the city level uh, and um, uh, in, in, in terms of driving changes. And that's why I think it's very interesting to be focused, it's very useful to be focused on that unit of uh, government and deployment uh, because you can get a lot to happen there and then it gets copied. Okay, so, so uh, th maybe that leads uh, Emily to you. So I am calling on her notwithstanding her, her baseball incli inclinations. Um, so, so Emily, um, Boston under the leadership of Mayor, Mayor Walsh, the, the enlightened leadership of Mayor Walsh is a, uh, is a signatory of the, of the w WHO um, initiative and the AARP uh, age, age friendly initiative which really contemplates change in, in all segments of, of society within the city health and housing and transportation and uh, and workforce uh, is issues and, and, and the like uh, just give us a, a very fast sense just a just a high level overview of the kinds of things that you're doing in, in Boston to make it a more age friendly city Sure, so we're, we're doing a lot of things, touching on a lot of different sectors. Um, I would say a couple of the things we've done over the last year, we're working with our team at the city around our uh, Vision Zero work, so going towards no traffic fatalities, and we're looking at intersections and the ability to use sensors and look at traffic patterns. The reason this is so important for older adults is because more than half of our pedestrians who have been hit and killed are older adults. We want to make sure that walking is safe in our city, and so we've been heavily invested in that and working with our team at the city to try to do some of that work. We also have, we focus on big things like that. We've also focused on some quality of life issues. So we heard from our residents. Our entire plan comes from our residents. Um, we heard from over 4,000 uh, 4, of our older adults uh, to help feed the, what we decided to do in the plan. Um, but they said to us, you know, we want to access business districts, um, but we have two issues. Um, we, have, uh, we have a lot of purchasing power, um, but sometimes businesses aren't friendly for us, and we often have to find a restroom when we're shopping and there's none to use. So we've done two different things there. We've looked at age and dementia-friendly businesses and how we work with businesses to do small things like enlarging print, um, uh, it, like um, uh, uh, enlarging aisles, doing better lighting, um, and all of the businesses go through this program. Also, go through uh, customer service training, where they're looking, where they're learning about ageism and stereotypes, and also looking at good communication skills and communication techniques. And then the second thing we did in partnership with our uh, with our uh, technology office 
is look at, and, and a lot of our city services, is look at all the public restrooms in Boston. We were able to map those and create, uh, create an online map where people can search for their specific intersection, pull up their closest public restroom. They can search for certain hours. They can search for accessible stalls. They can search for transgender bathrooms and pull up uh, where, they can, where they can access a restroom. And then for those people, we know that a lot of uh, our residents don't have access to technology, especially our low-income communities and communities of color. Um, uh, some have access, but some do not. So they can also just pick up the phone, call us at the city at 311, any time of the day, say, where's my closest public restroom, and we'll let them know. So, so it's from large scale to small scale. Good, so, and I, I wanna talk about uh, ac access uh, kind of as it relates to social determinants in, in a little while, but first I wanna go to, to Lauren. So, so we've talked about uh, some kind of micro solutions, small solutions. So Lauren, you, you had a strategy at, at Uber. That, that's, that's a big solution. It's between what, three and a half and four million people failed to get to their, to their physician's appointments mm -hmm. in the United States uh, last, last year. And I know Uber's uh, work, working on that. So talk about, uh, talk about not, not only kind of why you're interested in, in this, but how you see, not just, not just Uber specifically, but how you see the, the promise of technology affecting lives. Yeah, so uh, the way I think we look at technology is that we can utilize uh, some of the assets that we have existing already. So in Uber's case, it's a very vast driver network uh, and technology that lets someone request or schedule a ride very easily uh, and apply them to, to problems that already exist in an ecosystem. So um, in the Uber use case, because that's the one I'm most familiar with, um, we've done, I think it's been nine years now that Uber's been in existence, and we've done 10 billion trips, right? And so that's a, a huge number in a short period of time, but we're always looking for new ways to improve the lives of people in the communities that we serve. Uh, and so it was about two years ago now where um, I, I had a bit of healthcare experience before joining Uber five years ago, so I knew about social determinants of health, and I understood that transportation was a barrier to care. So I dug in on that research. I saw that missed appointments are one of the, the biggest issues in, in our healthcare ecosystem, both for um, patient outcomes, but also in terms of uh, healthcare facilities running smoothly and you know just patient engagement overall. Um, so I put together a proposal that outlined what the opportunity was in healthcare for Uber, but more so that I felt we had a responsibility to do something about it, right? We have the ability to, um, to really connect these assets in a way that addresses a very specific problem. So for those that aren't aware, we launched a program or product really uh, in March of this year called Uber Health, which is a HIPAA compliant dashboard that enables healthcare organizations uh, to request or schedule rides up to 30 days in advance for patients or caregivers uh, that are either going to and from care or caregivers that are going into the home setting. Uh, and this solution has been definitely great on a large scale for some of the larger hospital systems or you know, health networks, but it also does work very, quite well uh, in the smaller use cases, right? So we've built uh, a self-serve onboarding flow that makes it really easy for uh, community hospitals or small clinics to sign up online and be up and running within 24 hours. And so um, they're able to take advantage of the assets that we have and apply it to the pain points that they have in their industry. And you now can, t can take uh, cu customers, clients, d door to door. Sure, yes. Right? So um, the Uber Health dashboard will enable uh, the healthcare organization to request whatever ride type they want in that market. So one of the ride types that you're mentioning is called Uber Assist, uh, and that's uh, when uh, someone who might need door-to-door -door transportation as opposed to curb-to-curb uh, -curb is able to get that assistance from a driver that has like a different you know, level of service. Uh, we also have Uber Wave, which is wheelchair accessible vehicles, which is quite helpful, especially uh, in the city setting where sometimes they just need to take a short ride and it's not easily uh, available. So. Um, we're excited to be able to say, hey, we're really good at logistics and, and the technology side of things. Why don't we let care providers do what they're good at and, and use our solutions for that purpose? So I want to come back to, back to Dave in, in a minute and ask him about some of the things that he that he's sees in, in the market because you've already told us that everything exists. It's just a question of, of ado adoption, adaptation, understanding, et cetera. But I know, Liddy, you've kind of written about and commented on the, the notion that technology is not a silver bullet, 
that um, that it's it, it it in and of itself is not the not the not the ultimate solution. So what do you what do you mean by that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there are a couple of things. I think there isn't one technology that's going to be the silver bullet that makes aging wonderful for everybody. Um, aging is a diverse experience. Um, people age at different rates, so they experience different um, health outcomes as they're aging and health realities as they're aging. Um, I think there are a few things about technology that we look at at Georgetown. One is um, there's a tremendous amount of discussion in the industry about technology solving problems. And most of that is framed from the standpoint of s s solving problems for those who are trying to deliver services to older people. Um, we do most of our work is human-centered design work, where we really try to get into the shoes of the older person themselves or the aging person themselves and try to understand what their day-to-day -day life is and how they use technology um, for their own purposes, whether it's entertainment or efficiency, and then try to extrapolate from there what are the technologies that are likely to really work and support people. Um, and there are a few things that I, I think about that. One is, um, we were saying in the room as we were warming up, the boomers are the most resourceful generation, certainly that I can think of in the past 150 years. Their ability to create opportunity from um, social challenges and demographic shifts is, is really extraordinary, and they don't take no for an answer. So when the boomers want something, they let you know. Uh, I, I sometimes remind my millennial friends that we invented the internet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> take credit for it, but very different from the World War II generation whose attitude was, I, I, you know, I want to just sort of retire into the background. So I think we, the boomers will show us what technologies are really going to work well for them, um, and I think they will lead us in directions. But I think an important thing to think about, I, I got a great insight from my father-in-law, who's um, 84, and he said that his friends, he's in very good health, uh, particularly intellectually, so a lot of his friends are five to seven years younger. And he said just the change in morale of people in their early 80s in the past five years since Uber and Lyft have become a part of life. It's not, they're not happy because they can get to the doctors. They're happy because they are active participants in nightlife. They think about themselves as a fundamentally different age from what an 82-year-old thought of themselves as. 10 years ago. So we're going to have people who, you know, what really makes you age well is feeling relevant, feeling vibrant, yeah. feeling that you can be a part of the fabric of society, intergenerational connections. I think there's an enormous opportunity for aging not to be something you have to go do privately by the side of the highway in an aging community, but something that you can do completely intertwined with what everybody else in society is experiencing. And that there's you know, giving back and forth between the generations. And I think that's really the big opportunity. But we have to, to change the frame to what is it that will make people feel engaged and vibrant, not how do I, as a medical system, solve a problem for myself. I think that there's a, there's a, a fundamental difference between those two. And that's, to my mind, where the, where the big opportunity is. So, so Emily, whether it's uh, intergenerational connection or the ability to continue to work or access to, to health resources or cultural characteristics or all the other wonderful things that, that, that cities offer. If, if Dave was the U.S. czar of technology, what would, what would you say to him you want for, for Boston? That, by the way, he says he already has, but for some reason the two of you just haven't connected on it. So what would you, what would you say to Dave? Sure. So I mean, I would say I would say a couple of things. So first of all, just on a on an overall city level, we've actually developed or um, it's it's a living document, but we have a guide, um, a smart city guide for technology companies that approach us. And one of the things is similar to um, what was just being said. One of the things we say to people is, have you talked to our residents? Like, go and talk to our residents. At, find out what their issues are and then approach us with solutions. Don't just come to us with a product. And so I think that piece really, really thinking about what do people need and then how do we solve those problems are huge. Um, or in kind of the aging sphere, I think um, there are a couple of things that we heard as we talked to people around our age-friendly plan that technology companies could be um, really useful for solving. Um, so one is, and, and we were surprised by how much we heard this as we spoke with people, and it was through all the different domains that we looked at, access to information. People feel like they don't know 
how to get connected, whether that's connected to a program, connected to a service, or just connected to what's going on in community. They want to feel engaged. They want to uh, be active in helping to solve their issues by accessing different things, um, but they don't know how to find that information. And so I think that um, that's a very complex issue, right? Because we have lots of languages, lots of diversity, people who use technology, people who don't use technology. Um, but I think that, uh, that um, technology companies can be really a partner with us in helping to think through solutions to that. Um, the second thing I would say is, this, uh, is social isolation. I've heard about that in a couple of sessions I, I've been in today. I will say that we really, we brought a lot of people together trying to figure out um, both older adults, um, uh, community organizations, uh, different city departments, trying to figure out how do we address this in our plan. There's an ultimate challenge there of finding people who are socially isolated and then figuring out the best way to connect with those folks. We do, uh, we did ha have a challenge. I'm really interested to see the outcome of it. Um, uh, Massachusetts is becoming an age-friendly state and as part of that, we put out a challenge along with GE and a couple of other companies saying, you know, what are your solutions for social isolation? I think it will be really interesting to see what people come back with around that. So, so Dave, the order's in from, from Boston, and it sounds like from Massachusetts as well, but let's just fo let's, let's focus on Boston. So, uh, so uh, pe people want to be connected, and they want to they want to be connected in, in the way that they want to be connected, uh, understanding their, di their diversity. They're looking for solutions to, to social isolation, obviously uh, not something that, that technology necessarily can solve on itself, but what do you, what do you think about potential responses to this? Well, we've absolutely seen the same thing in terms of research and uh, social and ethnographic studies that we've done in many countries, uh, having purpose being socially connected to the family and the community that one has been involved with um, uh, and, and a few other things are really just common fundamental um, tenets. Uh, the, if I take the technology point that you talked about, about let's say, but in the back end of the institutions, uh, I, I just want to quickly lay out a couple of key, key points that are common topics. Um, the interoperability of data that exists in institutional silos. Right? Uh, a, a, a huge challenge, Never, not, a, not actually a technology challenge. It's always an implementation, an integration, a program, um, a process, a rule changes oriented challenge. And um, <clears throat> we're, we're very often in the situation of saying, okay, well, we, you know, it's, it's not quite, we know a guy, but we work with companies that, that that, that do this day in and day out um, and help vanquish those solution uh, deployment and integration issues. I want to touch on move, moving out quickly as we've talked about things being connected. Well, uh, th across the city, um, things are getting smarter. They're getting connected. Um, and the, uh, with the use of more advanced algorithms inside the technology solutions such as AI, becoming more autonomous the ability to make decisions a little bit more transparently, or I'm sorry, invisibly. Um, <clears throat> and so the, uh, you know, <coughs> if you ever walked up to uh, a, a, a city intersection um, and, and see that intersection very adeptly handle the traffic load that's there, that's autonomous uh, under the covers behavior. Um, now, <clears throat> there's infrastructure there, there's technology there, so there's a few <coughs> um, sort of tectonic evolutions of technology that will be helpful. So if you're planning cities, you know, it takes a generation to put a new piece of infrastructure in place uh, through a city, let alone an entire state. Um, so the uh, 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 one, uh, the technology lens on that is um, is to take the technology for smart things, the technology for connecting things, and the technology for autonomously and analyzing and interoperating, handling big and heterogeneous data is continuing to march forward. So uh, a strategic plan for a city would today include an AI uh, strategy, a 5G strategy, uh, and a smart things uh, strategy on how that's the whole infrastructure can be moved forward in a way that's um, uh, not for a particular use case, but a way that provides 
enormous capacity for use cases that are not yet to be imagined. So is it happening? Um, and if so, yes, so it's at, you've got to talk <coughs> to the mayors. Okay. Um, and uh, I guess the last point in terms of, it's really important to realize the, the decade it takes to do something meaningful in terms of laying out infrastructure and to, Lydia, your point about the cohorts and the ages, you know, after the boomers, 10 years from now, um, millennials uh, will, be, will be 50 plus and digital natives will be turning 30. And so the expectations of every cohort of age group is ratcheting very rapidly. So the last thing I meant just to connect back to what you were talking about is in terms of making a 10 or 20 year infrastructure plan at a city level, um, looking at, absolutely looking at the boomers. Because right? we've seen projects, I've seen projects overseas that were designed for the then 80 year olds. And by the time they were deployed, it was a different generation that was the target audience. Mm -hmm. And it missed the mark. So the, um, there's today's seniors of um, there's few depression era left, um, boomers are maybe the, this, the sweet spot, but the next generations have different expectations um, have, and value systems. And, um, and from a building and infrastructure for a city, um, the digital natives will be, uh, in, in about 20 years, will, will be the, the mainstream market for that infrastructure. So for um, we did maybe just kind of a jump off for, for Lauren and, and Liddy. So um, so the so the prospects I think for, for many of us probably for most of us in, in, in this room are are really bright. So so the prospects for for enhanced mobility for improved uh, not only not only technological access but the use of digital health tools and a whole variety of things that empower us and enable our control and all the rest. But what we also know is a very significant proportion of the population is left behind, is not experiencing increased longevity, is not uh, enjoying health, uh, lives in, particularly in the United States, we have these, these, uh, these really exceptional disparities across, across the cities in, in our country. What, uh, you know, betw between Cambridge and Roxbury, uh, live, lives are very, very different. So, so for those who, you know, who don't go to Harvard or MIT, uh, for those who are not uh, at least on staff at, at, at Uber or on, or on staff at, at Intel uh, and who are living very, very different lives, uh, what's the prospect for them uh, enjoying the benefits of all this, this great stuff to come? Well, I, I think um, <coughs> there's a lot of focus in the existing aging industry on the top decile and on the bottom quintile. And the top decile is just full of opportunity. That's like, you know, making, what do they say? Making hay in a barrel, whatever, shooting fish in a barrel. Um, the bottom quintile is an extremely challenging situation. Um, and n not just because of lack of resources in urban environments that are being displaced, um, because younger people are moving into cities and bidding up prices. Um, you have a lot of families disintegrating over arguments about whether the family home should be sold or not, um, in cases where they actually own a house. Um, that's a big problem in DC. Um, so I think it is, it's extremely challenging. And, but, but there are a lot of programs and impact investing um, programs focused on how to change outcomes with the bottom quintile. Where I see, frankly, the greatest risk is the middle three quintiles, where these people are solidly middle class, um, they're in their late 60s with a net worth of about $200,000, and they're probably going to run out of money when they're about 80. And so we're going to have, that's, you know, 60% of the population is going to be in an economically very, very stressed situation in about 15 years, probably with very little money and possibly with homes or apartments that um, do not have the value that we think they're gonna have. They're not gonna have the market value, particularly if people are selling in a glut. So I think that there is a real challenge there. And there's a real challenge with caregiving. Um, right now there's a half a trillion dollars of family caregiving um, contributed to the economy every year. I don't think that's scalable based on the number of caregivers we have to the number of people that are gonna be needing care. So we have some real challenges about how this is gonna get funded. 
Um, the good news is there's gonna be a lot of job creation in caregiving. Um, there's gonna be a lot of job creation in um, creating new industries around um, serving and supporting people as they get older. And I think that there's gonna be some societal gain to people learning how to team up in a way that we really haven't had to so much for the past 20 years outside of very defined communities. Um, and I remember when I was a kid, I grew up in Boston, every time it snowed, my parents sent me and my brother out to shovel out the little old ladies who lived down the street, there were three of them. And we belly ached about it, but you know, we really liked it. We liked feeling like we could make a contribution. And that doesn't exist in neighborhoods yep. anymore. So I think there, are, you know, there is some some really great opportunity there. Yeah. There's also, by the way, potentially a. Uh, although we're speaking about cities, not not speaking about the uh, the federal government, there may even be potentially the hope for some kind of bipartisan bipartisan um, collaboration in that regard. Uh, ben Sass just wrote an interesting book that that touches on on all this that that I'd commend. So so Lauren, so you, you guys have completely reinvented. Uh, Transit. I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting to hear about the business plan for, for, for Uber caregiving. Uh, who, who knows? I mean, maybe it's next. But no, seriously. What? So, we know. The, so we know the challenges, and there have been a lot. There's been a lot of conversation else, elsewhere in this in this summit about about these challenges, the challenges of caregiving, the challenges of chronic disease, the uh, our inability to compress uh, mortality and morbidity. Um, and a whole series of other things, and obviously um, uh, not just income inequality, but, but health inequality. How can solution, uh, how can tech, tech at least uh, narrow some of these gaps? Um, I think it's about meeting people where they are, right? I think that like, sure, we have smartphones and we have credit cards and we're able to download an app and set up an account and you know, pay for our rides to and from dinner or a business meeting, but not everyone is in that boat, and so, um, you know, with Uber Health or with Uber Central, one of our product, another dispatch product, uh, it doesn't require that someone need a smartphone to request their own ride because someone else who's tech savvy and has access to internet and to the means to pay for that ride will request it on their behalf. Um, in some situations, like there are a number of senior living facilities that uh, will request the ride on behalf of an older adult and they will subsidize the cost of that ride. Um, they'll send them you know, a bill at the end of the month with like a, a fraction of what that cost is. Um, but also an Uber ride is you know, on average 40% cheaper than a taxi and so our, our prices are not that high to begin with, so it is more manageable. Um, but even you're talking about how, um, you know, as baby boomers age, their uh, comfort with tech is different. And so, as an example, we just uh, we did a lot of user research. Um, but our assumption was like, okay, they're not going to be comfortable with tech at all. But we were wrong. And what we learned is that there's actually uh, quite a bit of comfort with text messaging and SMS. So even if someone doesn't have a smartphone, they probably have a phone that will let them send an SMS. So uh, we'll let you know the ride get requested from the dashboard, and then when someone is ready for a return ride home, they will send you know the the number one the Uber emoji, <laughs> Uber emoji, whatever you want to <laughs> call it. But yeah. they text the number one to initiate that return ride when they're ready. And what that allows is for someone to maybe go to the doctor to you know, go walk across the street to the pharmacy or to pick up whatever else they need and then to request the ride when they're ready. And so it gives them more autonomy and you know, that ability to live their life the way they've always were used to um, without necessarily needing to have um, the tech or the desire or the means to pay for those rides. So, so Dave, yeah, I was going to say same yeah. question. So you talked, you've talked a little bit about about kind of tech change at at a, at a system level, yeah. right? So, so what about this this question of individual empowerment? And again, specifically through this lens of of democratization of of access, not for you and I, but for for those who who haven't lived such fortunate um, lives. Well, let me pick up a little bit on that. It's look, look I, I think we. It's helpful to look at other industries. So health, health, healthcare um, should be looking at financial services and how it reaches uh, its audience and travel, um, and, it, and it reaches the seniors. I mean, you were making me when you were telling you made me think about. I, I would I got a te I get a text on my phone as soon as I turn it on when the plane lands years before about where my bag is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, 
years before my pharmacy send, has sent me a text telling me there's a, <laughs> there's a time to renew my prescription. Years. Mm -hmm. um, so the travel industry's got it figured out. Seniors uh, a, a, a represent a very large uh, part of their market, more so than ever before, financial services as well, for so many different reasons. So I think they're, in terms of engagement, and then communication, uh, you think about it as patient engagement, um, the, the, you know, the, the, the phone and the text message um, is a touch point. I'm reminded of a conversation related to India. Um, the population in India uh, you know, left a meeting in the morning, how it was so technologically unsophisticated, we really couldn't do anything there. And in the afternoon, hearing a proposal about a company, company that was uh, using text messages uh, to do uh, distributed uh, cardiac monitoring for uh, congestive heart failure um, uh, patients in, in India. Uh, well, of course, everybody's got a phone that can text, and that, that's how you pay for things as well. So the, um, I think um, I would agree in terms of uh, meeting folks where they are. And there's one other point that I've been thinking of as you ask this question. I want to draw down from an earlier panel that uh, Secretary Carson talked about is that um, a wrap around integrated solutions to the need of a community. That um, this unfortunately involves interdisciplinary work going across the, the housing and maybe the welfare and then the healthcare and the community support and the, the parks and recs department and, um, and the garbage department. But if you can, uh, uh, the, it, what he talked about is if you wrap around a solution of an integrated set of services that really meets the need of that community, that can really, you can, they can make progress. And so, so that's, um, yeah. I think these are, these are uh, super challenging to be done at a national level, but I'll go back to the mayor point again. Mayors can, even if they don't control all those budgets, they, they have the political position um, to make a lot of interdisciplinary innovation happen. So, so Emily, I asked you what, what you'd ask the, the, the tech folks on the panel if you had the opportunity to issue the order. Let me, ask, let me put you on the spot and ask you what you'd ask your, your boss. So, so if, if, uh, if you had uh, a whole big new budget allocation oh. and, we, and, and, and I said to you, you need to, you need to spend it on something that represents a tech solution, investment in, yeah. uh, in engaging your, your uh, constituents um, in addressing some of the challenges, uh, so, social connection, um, isolation, et cetera, that you've, you've talked about. Uh, how, how do you think you'd spend it? Sure. So, um, so wow, that's that that would be fabulous to have a whole new budget. Um, but but I think I think there's a couple of issues that I would see us spending it on, and and uh, I, I may not be thinking big picture enough because I'm not usually presented with a very large budget. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, but one of our primary issues right now in the city of Boston is housing. And so we're all looking at that housing, housing issue and how we can really think very creatively about housing, whether it's building on city land over, over, um, you know, over city resources like fire departments or libraries, um, or um, thinking about just the, the very basic nature of how we can uh, use technology to help people with housing search and application process, which can be very difficult for some people. Um, so I think some of that budget would really need to go towards um, figuring out how we scale up some of these housing solutions that we've been pilot testing in Boston and um, trying to figure out so that we can, uh, our goal is really to keep the people living in the city, living in the city. We have a very aggressive housing plan to build 60, 69,000 more units of housing by 2030. Um, and we just laid out a regional plan with, uh, with all of our uh, regional mayors. Um, but it's a challenge uh, to keep people in their homes and, and we need to figure out the solution to that. Um, the other piece I see is really this um, social engagement piece. How do we keep people active? How do we keep people having purpose? And how can we use technology um, for solutions to that? Um, and so I think, I think it's, um, you know, it's something that our constituents um, have told us they wanted. 
Um, and so I think that I think that there are technology solutions around that that we could that we could figure out and leverage if we were able to uh, to partner and have a budget to do Good. so. So I, I'm going to I'm going to come out to the audience for for questions, any questions, uh, just in a, in a moment. But but maybe Liddy, before I, I do, so you know you've both been a proponent of and a skeptic about about. Uh, so technology is kind of an ultimate solution. So what message would you deliver to the, to the folks on my left about the way they and their colleagues should be thinking about uh, doing more? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I'm a skeptic about it. I think I'm a skeptic about technology being given to people rather than people evolving to the solution that they want. Okay. So I would say definitely listen, walk a mile in their shoes, create a persona that you can get inside and pretend to be that person and think from their perspective. It's so easy to forget to do that, um, particularly in a world where technology forces you to try to make decisions faster. Sometimes you do need to slow down. I, I would say one other thing that I'm looking at Laura Latham, who's done a bunch of work with us. I think there are gonna be some fundamental changes to space in cities because of technology. If Uber and Lyft are right, a lot of cars are going to go away, a lot of parking lots are going to go away, a lot of retail is going to go away and be replaced by e-commerce. So there's going to be an opportunity for us to reimagine some spaces in cities for to be sort of community centers for people, you know, older people to tutor children. Sure. So I think that's another thing that, that to think about the technology itself and then think about the byproduct of the technology. Both of those, I think, are equally important. Good. Um, who's, got a, who's got a question? Let's, we have one right up, he, right up here. So we'll, uh, we do want you to use the mic so we can capture what you're saying. Hi, in, int introduce yourself. Sure, hi, I'm Sarah Dash. I'm president of the Alliance on Policy. We're a nonpartisan group here in Washington. Hi, Sarah. And uh, thank you for the panel. It's really insightful. I'm wondering, um, some of you kind of touched on the idea of the new world that we're living in, where we're talking about both investments in technology as well as investments in infrastructure. I was particularly fascinated by the sort of mismatch that you mentioned um, between the sort of the generations growing into technology and the timeline that it usually takes for infrastructure. What are some of the opportunities around intergenerational, thinking about this in an intergenerational way, um, you know, whether it's bathrooms for um, older, older adults as well as, you know, young nursing moms or like social engagement, um, social isolation, teenagers, I can't get mine off of their phones. Like, could you kind of share some insights around that? Thanks. Maybe anybody want to jump in? Take it. Lauren? I have one point to, to make. I think that's part of at least how we're thinking about it. I think um, <clears throat> with Uber Health specifically, we just uh, created a feature where um, within a request for a ride, you can add like, um, it's a, you sort of like CC a family member basically on the request. And so uh, it's like a caregiver contact. So when I, uh, when my grandmother is going to the doctor, she can have me listed as someone who receives those text messages that says like, you know, Grandma Jane made it to the doctor, or, oh, Grandma Jane is on her way home from the doctor. And so there's a way that I can be accountable and know what's going on without her feeling obligated to do so. We also, within the core app, we have the ability for you to request a ride for someone else. And I think um, I, this is a trend that we're noticing more and more of, where, like, you want to be a part of what's going on with your family members without necessarily... Uh, being too involved and so my hope is that more tech companies think about those features and for us it's like another thing to add to the roadmap it's really you know all tech changes take time but it's not a big deal in terms of what the uh, you know what effect it could have on the other side so we're excited about it um, but I'd love to hear your guys thoughts too. Dave. I'd love to hear the research side, but I just want to mention education. Um, that for a city, it's educational resources. It's, it's uh, community colleges and 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 and, uh, uh, and, and colleges are um, a, a place where uh, seniors um, either attending for continuing education and that intellectual um, challenge, but also. Um, in community college to go and teach. And so there's a mix up, a mashup of the generations happens, happens there. And, um, and so the, uh, we've also heard of ex examples of the um, senior for senior, uh, senior for senior going this way, but then also you can do senior as a mentor. Uh, and so those kinds of programs that can 
it, and what they're doing is they're feeding the individual's sort of generative desires at this, that point in their life to have meaning, have purpose, um, and be connected socially. I mean, I think that technology is the great unifier of generations. Older people really don't like their own children telling them what to do. They're in a reverie when their grandchildren show up and tell them what to do. So I think there's a huge opportunity for smart home technology where they're, you know, p teaming up with their grandchildren. You know why grandparents and grandchildren get along so well? Why? Common enemy. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, game playing, photo sharing, um, just tech support. I mean, my daughter used to joke that she thought that the number of hours she spent giving her grandparents tech support should count toward her community service credit for school. We said it doesn't really work that way. Um, <clears throat> but I think that there's, a, you know, we've got the highest incidence of intergenerational living in the United States now since the 1920s. Um, there's a great opportunity for joy in both directions and you know, real enjoyment. I think that there can be sort of safety monitoring. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of work on smart home stuff. Um, but also just the, the pleasure of being more connected and being able to laugh in real time. So. Yeah, I would say we've seen some interesting examples in some of our planning processes of intergenerational connection and learning about different generations' needs and interests. So for example, our park, um, when we look at new parks, um, there were a lot of mothers and children and, and um, uh, kind of park activists showing up to a lot of the community meetings about parks, but not a lot of older adults, even though they think parks, um, they said in our survey, was one of their greatest assets. And so we've really done a lot of work engaging older adults in that park planning process and, and um, looking at how can we bring together different generations in that process because they want different things out of their parks. And, and when you look at all the different things they want, it makes a good park for all. So for example, um, we had a bench around a tree in one of our parks that had no, uh, no back and, and uh, no arms, right? So it's great for kids, uh, maybe for parents, um, not good for older adults for getting up. And so just by changing that, that bench, then grandparents who are watching their kids at the playground um, or, or older adults who are just out to enjoy the park um, have a better experience. But it's interesting to see the learning that goes on in a setting like that amongst everybody. This, this, is, this is, I think, one of the powers of, of cities. It's, it's that this is the place where older people and younger people bump, bump into each other in, in productive ways. And we kind of, in, in the, in the post-World War II era, we, we had this, this um, narrative, pr narrative promoted that the objective for older people was a life of leisure in an age-segregated community someplace built in a desert with a, with a rec center and a nine-hole golf course and a in a, in a cafeteria while you waited to die, and maybe maybe the the young people came and visited you at at, at some stage. And what we know is that uh, in 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 the emerging generation of older adults, and certainly generations to come, there's very little interest in that. So the 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 intergenerational warfare, which by by the way is oftentimes promoted within uh, the within the city in which we live currently. Uh, really doesn't exist, that older people and younger people have this necessary connection, not just generative uh, in inclinations uh, of older adults, but really uh, a desire by, by both generations to connect and, and find meaning in the relationship. So, great question. Question up front? Wait, wait, we're gonna hold you, have you wait for a mic. Thank you. Thank you, I'm um, such an interesting panel. Um, my question is directly, um, Thank for Dave and Lauren, although I'm really also very interested um, in what Lady and Emily and Paul think. Um, so you seem to work like health, how Uber thinks of health and how Intel thinks of health just seems to be. I don't think most of the people in this room necessarily think of health as like the number one thing that you do. It's even interesting that it's in your titles. It does seem to be more about like systems and things. And I wonder there's so much interesting um, di like discussion at this gathering about prevention. And so how do you think about prevention? You know, like Uber, there's obviously, it's like so many people are in there, so many Uber drivers, like probably could be 
even healthier, things like that, that as an opportunity, or them giving information, or Intel, how do you think about Intel promoting prevention? Um, and then, Paul, like, what would you like to see all of the, um, like, big companies, powerful companies, employers doing? Um, and <laughs> Lydia and Emily, like, what interesting things have you noticed about prevention that you could say? Because the power that you could all have on, the, on impacting prevention is huge, but this... Okay. I think we, we got it, so we'll, we'll try to zip, zip down yeah. the line. Um, so for us, I think that um, f at first, our uh, teams were all maybe tasked with like thinking about healthcare or you know this population 5% of the time and nothing was really happening or getting done. And so part of that initial proposal was like, hmm, what if we have a team that is 100% dedicated to this, then we can actually like get products out the door and really focus on it and make something happen. So that's really why you know health is in my title. Um, but in terms of prevention, I think something uh, some of you might have seen at different points, uh, we st our first experiment in healthcare was actually on-demand flu shots. So in 2014, uh, for one day per year, we put nurses in cars. Uh, we did it again in 2015, 2016, where you could press a button, a nurse would come to you and give you a flu shot. Um, that was a very interesting public health initiative. It was something that was replicated in Uber cities all over the world with different, uh, you know, prevention concepts that mattered there. So in some cases it was diabetes testing or uh, childhood vaccine. So it really depended on what the teams in those markets wanted to do. But it was just an interesting uh, model for us where we could use our engagement channels to promote awareness around specific issues. You're doing more of that now? So I think for Uber, um, those ideas are always coming toward us both um, externally and internally and city teams all over the world. So we have operations teams that are located in most of our major markets. They have the autonomy to say, hey, we want to do this. Let's make it happen. So yes, I imagine there will be more of that. Um, I think for us, uh, we wanted to impact the the most or the greatest amount of patient lives in the shortest period of time and so it was like how do we attack this transportation as a barrier issue right. now uh, so we that's where this iteration of uber health has come from but i agree with you there's there's a lot we can do with the driver population as well in the u.s alone i think we have 750,000 active drivers. And so um, we do have uh, great engagement channels that we use to communicate with them and to suggest that um, you know, they do different prevention things. And we actually use the technology to remind them to you know, do different things at different points, whether it be you know, get out of the car, you know, right. stretch, things like that. I've got a great idea for you. There, there, so we're, we're entering an era in which, as a result of a couple of mergers, and one prospective merger, very, very large companies will be offering medical services on, on street corners across America. I've got a, a whole new idea. It's, it's called home visits for docs. Anyway, Dave. Uh, that, <laughs> that adjacent Dave. service for the food trucks. You got it, right? Okay. Health trucks. So, uh, uh, quickly, Dave. two things to try and touch on your question. So one, there's a tremendous amount, I'll just be very commercial, there's a tremendous amount of money that's spent making things for uh, life sciences and research and health and health delivery. And so, you know, our business, my, my business is um, supplying technology to companies that make the things that then are become solutions. Um, so the, um, in, the, in that space, and let's say the enterprise uh, uh, delivery of health, um, you know, a great sort of stepping stone to prevention is prediction. And so using analysis and technology, it's sort of inside the hospital to risk score the population who's there and get to people who might uh, be, uh, suffer a, a toxosis in a couple of days um, and prioritize the resources. This is not prevention like you're describing, but as a, as a step from dealing with acuity, dealing with disease, and then uh, using the technology and looking at now the digitization of all of the information available related to taking care of people and, and interventions, you can now prioritize resources in the system by predicting and scoring um, the, the, uh, how much and who needs to be at the head of the line. Uh, from a completely different perspective, employers, I think, um, we have uh, employers have uh, a lot of purchasing power. 
uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the health care and the services they, that they provide as benefits to their employees. And our company, like many others, is working to innovate uh, to provide support and services uh, to uh, our employee population to help our employees be, be, be healthier, which is a competitive advantage. Um, but it's also a retention and a sticking and a, a, a recruitment and a retention uh, element too, is particularly given the younger populations we're all now recruiting um, that the kind of companies they want to work for. And so um, the, there are great examples, no time to go into them, but great examples across um, large companies of uh, employers taking action to empower their employees and use their, uh, to, to take care of their health and also um, use their purchasing power to get better solutions for their employees. Uh, benefits that are as relevant to, to uh, old, young population, populations in, in companies as they are to old. Yeah, I would um, add two quick things. I completely agree about the employers. I would say that um, digital health is an enormous enabler of preventative medicine, whether you're dealing with things like flu shots or cancer screenings, um, that as a, as a medical facility, you can shame people into doing the things they're supposed to do. It used to be they would say, get your cancer screening and maybe you would or maybe you wouldn't. Now they're on you if you don't. So I think that's very helpful. Um, the other thing that I, would, that I would say that we're starting to see is, you know, healthy, healthy aging starts in your 20s. Um, and Gen Z is appearing to be more focused on proactive long-term health than preceding generations were. They're eating better, they're exercising more, they're getting outdoors more frequently, and there are some theories that it's because they are more engaged in caring for their grandparents than any generation before, and they're seeing the downstream effects of letting your weight get out of control when you're in your 20s. So I think there's some hope there in this multi-generational um, preventative stuff. Emily. I would just add quickly that um, most of what my uh, department does at the city is really concentrate on social determinants of health for older adults. And um, I think it's really important that we look at those through an access and an equity lens to make sure that everybody is, is um, uh, at the best place that they can be. So we have uh, about three and a half minutes left, but I'm going to give. I'm going to breach as I often do the, the rules. I'm going to give everybody 60 seconds, and um, and you have an opportunity. So we have a, a, an important audience of thought leaders, of doers, of of, of academicians and policy people and and, and business people and, and all the rest. So this is your chance for a call to action around um, around this question what can our what can our cities do to make themselves more age age friendly more quickly and what can technology do to uh, to act as an excel an accelerant so you want to start Emily sure um, I have I have <clears throat> two things first of all we are um, looking at scheduling software for our senior shuttle that does medical rides and it's brought up an interesting point we want efficiency but we want to balance that with what's really important to our riders, which is kind of the connection with their driver. So how do you balance that efficiency with kind of the high touch and what, what matters to people? And I think that's an important um, piece we should look at. So you and, you and Lauren need to have a cup of coffee. Liddy. <laughs> <clears throat> I would say multi-generational programming, so allowing people to interact and really engage each other, um, and then programs around financial equity. I think we're going to see real polarization of what people have access to, and cities being much more aware of um, the kind of equity stuff that you were talking about. Okay. Dave? Uh, be careful uh, about getting caught in a proof of concept and pilot trap, yeah. because proof of concepts and pilots prove out the things that can be easily done. They don't address the scale issues, which are administrative workflow, um, workforce uh, processes. You can do an awesome pilot without addressing any of the hard problems. So uh, take a look at the All of Us uh, program that the NIH is driving. That is not a small pilot. That is a million person program that, ha that has resulted in the hard problems of scale being brought into the square, into the sites of the program, and so um, if you've seen one or two POCs and it works, then go big, and because the issues of broad deployment will, you will only see if you're trying to do a very large uh, program. Totally agree with that, um, but also your point, I'm, I'm shocked oh, yeah. that somebody from Uber would, would think big. 
sorry. <laughs> um, but I would say collaborate with us, right? Like, I can't know what it is that you want unless you tell me. And so if you share with us the things that you're hoping for, your, like, your hopes and dreams, right? Like, we will help make it happen. So um, no idea is too out there. No idea is, is too wild to at least have a conversation about. So let's collaborate and make it so, happen. So I just want everyone to remember when, when the Boston Uber initiative is announced a month from now, <laughs> it, was, it was launched on the stage. Um, I want to I wanna thank, uh, thank every, everyone on stage for their terrific participation and encourage all of you to be thinking about how your cities can be um, places that, that enable uh, not only longer lives, but, but healthier lives. And thanks for joining us. We appreciate it.